Our dear loving Father, as we come before you, we pray, Father, for your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and fill our midst, that when we open the Bible and learn more about you, we open our hearts and our mind and our eyes that we will see your will and we will be touched by your word. You, as now, we will pray that you be with Joseph as he bring forth your message. May you help him and anoint his lips that give him wisdom from above that he will bring forth the message to encourage the congregation and help us to be able to study together. Thank you. We want to submit our time into your hands. May you lead us through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Uh, the, we, so some of us, the youth, we just came from botanical, so sorry if we look a bit um, sweaty. <laughs> um, this evening, we're going to study, uh, we're going to continue from where we have stopped last week. Uh, last week, we studied about Daniel chapter 1. And how many of you remember what is the key lesson that we've learned from Daniel chapter 1? If we could pick one key text for Daniel chapter 1, what would it be? Yeah, Daniel purposing in his heart, right? Daniel purposed in his heart that he will not defile himself, right? And so we've, we've learned that after Daniel purposed in his heart, what happened? God called him into something very important, right? God called him into prophetic office, right? And so, we picked up the story from Daniel chapter 2. Let's all go there. Um, I might not be following an, exactly the handout, but we would definitely answer the questions there. Daniel chapter 2, we'll start reading from verse 1. Uh, can someone read? Who has the mic? Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep break from him. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, I mean, sorry, Daniel, do you remember what was he already at this point in time? After chapter 1, we learned that how he was considered one of the what? Wise men, right? So he was already a wise man of Babylon. But interestingly, if you notice, the Bible says that in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, he dreamt a dream. Um, I don't know how many of you, I don't know how many of you um, question this, but do you notice that when was it that Daniel was brought captive into Babylon? What year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign? Do you all know? It was actually on his first year. Right. It was in his first year of his reign that Nebuchadnezzar um, surrounded Judah, um, Jerusalem and brought all those people from Judah captive. Right. Um, but just to clear something, Nebuchadnezzar actually reigned together with his father um, for two years. So you see, um, this may cause you a bit of confusion because it says that in the second year, Daniel was already called to uh, interpret dreams, right? But it, can't, it, it doesn't make sense. Why? Because, yeah, they were trained for three years, right? But here it says that Nebuchadnezzar dreamt a dream in the second year. But... It actually makes sense because Nebuchadnezzar actually co reigned with his father, Nebuchadnezzar, for two years. Yeah. So when the Bible says in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, it was actually the second year of his, um, how to say, yes, reign of Nebuchadnezzar reigning by himself. Right? So it's actually his sort of fourth year reigning as a king. Right? So just to give you all a bit of background. So, Nebuchadnezzar has a nightmare, right? Now, let's continue with verse 2. Oh, okay. 
Uh, maybe I could add a little bit to what you just said about yeah, the sure. three years and the second year. The calculation of uh, time of rain is based on any part of a year. So if uh, Nebuchadnezzar had become king the last week before the change of a year, let's say uh, 605 BC, it has only one more month and he became king it, during that month, and then it goes to 604 the next year. He would have, according to the culture, been reigning more than a year, even though it was just one month of the past year. So the second year uh, could be that uh, uh, he had one full year or a part of a year, and then the second year may be a full year. But Daniel probably was uh, trained in the f whenever Nebuchadnezzar became king. Okay, so if you look at the Bible commentary. He became king not for a full year when Daniel started his training. And that was considered one year. And then the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, a full year, that would have been considered Daniel's second year of training. And then uh, when Nebuchadnezzar started his second year of reign, that would have been considered Daniel's third year. So you don't even have the resort to saying that uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar spent two years co-regent, which he was, uh, and then uh, two years on his own. Uh, his father, Nebuchadnezzar, actually went to uh, another uh, city out in the desert. He didn't want to actually reign, and he allowed Nebuchadnezzar to run this city-state of uh, Babylon. So there are two ways of talking about the three years, which is partial years of Nebuchadnezzar. Thank you, Dr. All right, let's go to verse 2. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. Hmm. So over here we see that God gives Nebuchadnezzar a dream, right? And then what happens to the dream? He takes it away from him, right? And the, the king became so troubled that he called what? All the wise people in his, in his kingdom, right? He called, probably if you talk in the context of Malaysia, his whole cabinet, right? He called for a cab uh, meeting, right? Just to figure out his dream, right? Now, what are the role of a magician astrologer, sorcerer, and a Chaldean. Anyone know? Okay, magician. What does a magician do? That's magic, right? Okay. Uh, astrologer? R read the stars, okay. Sorcerer? They, they speak to the date, actually. Right. Chaldean is just wise men. Okay? Now, even though they were all four different professions, their ultimate goal was the same. And what was their goal? Their goal was to help the kingdom or help the king to understand and predict what's going to happen in the future. You know, kings back then, they are always very... Um, mindful of what's going to happen in the future. They're always worried about what's going to happen in the future, right? And so we see all those, you know, whenever you watch all those uh, old uh, movies, you see that there's a lot of fortune telling back in those days, right? Because they were all concerned about what's going to happen in the future, right? And so Nebuchadnezzar, expecting these people, right, they're supposed to be professionals, right, in predicting the future. He expects them to be able to tell his dream. But what happened? Let's continue. Verse 3. The king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Okay, let's continue. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in 
Syri Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we shall shew the interpretation. Continue. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Verse 6. But if ye shew the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore shew me the dream and the interpretation thereof. Verse 7. They answered again and said, Let the, let the king tell his servant the dream and we will shew the interpretation of it. Verse 8, the king answered and said, I know of certainty that ye would gain the time, because ye see the thing is gone from me. Verse 9, but if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak to before me, till the time be changed. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that ye can shew me the interpretation thereof. Verse 10, Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can shew the king's matter. Therefore there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. Verse 11. And it is, and it is a rare thing that the king require, requireth, and there is none other that can shew it before the king, except the gods, who dwelling is not with the flesh. Verse 12. Verse 12. For this, cause, for this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Mm. So what happened here? The king asked his uh, wisest people to come into his throne room and he asked them, right, wise men, can you tell me what I dreamt last night? I really had a bad dream, but I forgot what I dreamt, right? And he said, can you tell me what I dreamt and tell me what it means? And these wise people, right, these wise men, they, obviously they were not just wise, they were cunning, right? They asked the king, okay, king, tell us your dream and then we can tell you the interpretation, right? I mean, that's kind of normal, right? If you were to ask me, what is the meaning of this, right? Are you expecting me to guess what's that, what's this, if you, if you get what I'm saying? Or, you, I mean, they're not asking something unreasonable, right? But the king wanted to know what he dreamt. And, but what, what did the wise men say? The wise men said that, come on, man. Why are you asking such, I mean, I'm just paraphrasing, but they were saying that, please tell us your dream, then we will tell you the interpretation, right? And then the king became so angry, and he said what? If you don't tell me the dream, you're going to die. All of you, I don't care, you are the wisest people in Babylon, I don't care. You are just going to die. I'm going to put your, cut you into pieces. I'm going to, your house will become a dunghill. And so, we continue reading again. In verse 13. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. And verse 14 as well. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Ariok, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. Mm. So what happened next? The king called his guard, right? Ariok, come here. I want you to go to the whole kingdom and kill all the wise men, including the rookies, right? Those who just graduated to become a wise man. I'm going to kill them all. And so you imagine, right, Ariok comes to Daniel's house. Now, interestingly, right, Daniel, um, the Bible's record is that Daniel was not called by the king to the palace initially to interpret the dream. Now, this, will, this is actually God's providence. When you actually read, uh, continue reading, you actually find that this was actually the providence of God. But I want you to imagine, imagine this, guy coming to your door. Imagine this, you being Daniel, right? Someone comes to your door, knocks your door, and you open up and you find that it is, he is your executioner. How would you feel? You feel so scared, right? You, you wouldn't know what to do. You're like, okay, I'll do whatever you say. But what did Daniel say?
it's kind of interesting that Daniel was able to uh, even have a, a conversation with the executioner, with Ariok, right? I mean, if someone comes to execute you, do you have a say? <laughs> Would you have a say on, like, please wait a minute, can you say that? Usually, you can't, right? If they come to kill you, they'll come, they come and kill you. No questions asked, right? But we see, just from this verse, right, Daniel was a well-respected man. So much so that even when someone comes to execute him, they were willing to listen to Daniel. Because this guy recognized that, oh, Daniel, Daniel was the one who was 10 times wiser than everyone else. Daniel was the one who was the captive from Judah, but he was, he was so wise, right? Daniel was well-respected. Um, let's, let's continue reading this uh, from verse 15 until verse 18. Let's continue reading this. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time, that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his, com his companions, that they might seek mercies from God, from the God of heaven, concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Hmm. Now Daniel, as we have studied from last week, right? He had, he was, he had just overcome one obstacle, right? When he had to actually, he was, his faith was tested, right? Should I eat or should I not eat? Should I honor God or should I honor the king? Or, or should I be, uh, show gratitude to the king for his kindness, for giving me his food? Right. Daniel just overcame an obstacle and here he was facing another obstacle, right? He was in the face of certain death, right? I mean, someone came to kill him. I don't know how many of you have, I mean, I hope none of us have ever experienced this before, but can you imagine staring death right in front of you? Can you imagine how that feels? It must have been really hard, right? It must have been a big trial that Daniel was going through. But notice what was the very first thing that Daniel did when he was faced with trial. When he was staring at right in the face of death, what was his first response? So we, we understood that Daniel actually asked the king for time, right? So he was granted time. Then what did he do? The first thing he did, he went to his house and he told his friends, those three close friends of his, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. And he, what, what did he ask them to do? To pray. The first thing he did, he, he, no doubt he was the wisest, one of the wisest men in Babylon. But the very first thing he did was not to try and figure out himself what was the dream. He didn't go and look, look at the sun and count the stars or whatever. He didn't do all that. But the very first thing he did was to go on his knees. And I think this is a very important lesson for us to learn because too often, whenever we are faced with trial, the first thing we do is try to settle it ourselves. Too often, we always try to um, solve all the problems that we are facing, but we forget the most important thing is to pray. And so Daniel prayed. And he didn't, he didn't just pray by himself. He had friends. He had praying friends. Right? And what was the result of that? Let's continue reading. Verse 19. 
Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Hmm. So God, what did God do? God answered his prayer. Right? Let's continue. Verse 20 to 22. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changed the times and the seasons. He removed kings and set it up kings. He gave wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. For he re revealed the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. Mm. So, now the way Daniel praised God, right, actually gives us an idea of what this dream was all about. What, is, what, is, what was the few things that popped up? in your opinion. What was the dream about? It was about times and seasons, right? Um, it was about removing kings and setting up kings. And it was also about what? Revealing the deep secrets of the heart. Okay, let's continue. Verse 23 and 24. 23. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me what now what we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went in unto Ariok, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will shew unto the king the interpretation. So now God answered Daniel's prayer, right? And Daniel went straight to the palace. I mean, of course, he praised God, right? And he went straight to the palace, and what was the first thing that he said to the king? What was the first thing that he asked the king? Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Now, just from this verse, we learn something very profound about Daniel's character. Right? Daniel was a person who takes care of others. Daniel was a person who loves his enemies. Right? He didn't just take all the credit to himself. He didn't just um, say, okay, I managed to uh, get the dream, so all you wise men, you are of no use, so you can die. It's okay. Just spare me, it's fine enough. Daniel didn't do that, right? Although he knew that all those people, they were practicing wrong things. They knew, he knew that witchcraft was wrong, sorcery was wrong, magic, uh, magic, sorry, uh, magic was wrong. Um, he knew all those things were wrong, but yet he still asked the king, please, don't destroy all the wise men. Because why? I managed through God, of course. I mean, God has revealed to me your dream. You see, Daniel was anxious for them, right? And because of him, all the wise men were safe. Right? Because there was a man of God among them, among those wicked people, all of their lives were spared. And so it always was, right? It always has been, right? In the time of uh, Paul and Silas, because of Paul and Silas, all the prisoners were let loose. When Paul was... Uh, on the ship, right, going to Rome. Even though they were met with a storm, all the people on the boat were spared because of Paul. You see, the wicked benefits from the righteous. Daniel was righteous, right? Daniel was righteous and he was a blessing. And my question to us this evening is that, are we a blessing 
to the people around us? Or are we a curse? Are we like Daniel? When, when we are around when, when we are around people, people can feel that it's someone different, the atmosphere is different because why? There is a man of God in the midst of us. Right? Are we a blessing to the people around us? But let's continue. Verse 25. Then Ariok brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. It's kind of funny, right? Ariok takes all the credit to himself as, as, if he, as if he was the one who found Daniel. Right? But <laughs> it's okay. Let's go on. <laughs> Just to be... Let's go on from verse 26 uh, until verse 28. Verse 26. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king had demanded cannot the wise man the astrologers, the magicians, the, sh the soothsayers show unto the king. 28. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the later days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. Now we see very clearly here that Daniel doesn't take credit to himself, right? Even though he managed to find out about the dream, when the first thing he did was to praise God and was to give God all the glory, right? And so we have to also be careful, right? To never take the talents and the gifts that God has given us and to give ourselves all the glory. Right? Because it is God who gives us all these gifts and talents. Just like God gave Daniel the dream. Right? So, um, so verse 28 says, But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and make known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Right? So this dream is about, somehow is, this dream is about the latter days. Right, which means the end times. So we get, sort of get a clue that this dream is not about Babylon. Right? It's not about what's happening back then. It's more about ha what's going to happen at the end times. Right? Okay, so let's continue. Verse 29. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. Mm. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. But for their sakes, that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou might know the thoughts of thy heart. You see, one of the purpose of prophecy, one of the reasons why we study prophecy is so that we would know the thoughts of our heart. Right? Because if you don't start thinking about the future, if you don't care about the future, it won't be the thoughts of your heart. Right? Um, the purpose of prophecy is to help us put um, in proper perspective of how we should live today, right? To, and also to help us understand how we should prioritize our life today as well, right? And so Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar, right, that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. And so it is the most important thing for us as well as we study prophecy. What is God trying to tell our heart? 
what is God trying to reveal in our heart? Right? Let's continue. Verse 31. Verse 31. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you, and the form was awesome. All right, um, now we are getting into the image, but before that, anyone has any input first before we continue? Or questions? Okay, let's go right into the uh, dream. Okay, um, we'll read all the way from verse 31 up to verse 35. This image's head was of fine gold, <coughs> his, bre his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay, so what is this dream about? Um, I was actually planning to project an image of the dream, but uh, it's okay. But what is the dream about? Someone tell me. It is an... What did Nebuchadnezzar dream about? An image, right? Okay, let me just try to draw it out. So this image. Okay, I'm really bad at this. Okay. So... Now, r remind me again, Babylon, right? This dream was given to who? That Nebuchadnezzar, right? Now, Babylon, what, what, what country was it? Was it a Christian country or was it heathen, right? It was a pagan country, right? What do they worship? Idols, right? And so, God is a relevant God, right? He... Um, speaks in the language of um, in the language that we understand right and so in Nebuchadnezzar's language this image caught his attention why because Babylon was an idol worship nation right and uh, if you actually uh, just to give you all extra information uh, as you study Daniel 7 Daniel 8 we'll read about all those beasts right the ram, the goat. This was now why that, uh, God gave Daniel this dream was because remember the ram, the goat. What were they used back in those times in the Jewish nation? Sacrificial uh, animals, right? So God tried to speak in a language that Nebuchadnezzar could understand, right? And so He gave him a dream about an image. Now, what was this image uh, comprised of? What does this image comprise of? Let's try to break it down. So there is a head, right? There's also rest and arms, right? Belly and thigh and legs, right? Legs and feet. Now, what, what, are, the, what are the methods? What are the metals that we... So, okay, head of gold. Arms and uh, breast, breast of uh, br silver. Then, belly of, uh, belly and thigh of brass. And then, legs of iron. Feet of Iron plus clay. What happened to the dream? Uh, what happened 
in a dream to this image. There was a rock. It came. Sorry, my drawing is very messy. And crushed this image into pieces, right? And what happened to this image? It became a, not this image, but this image became crushed into pieces and the rock became a, what? A mountain. Right, so this is essentially what Nebuchadnezzar dreamt about. And he was so troubled, right? He was so troubled by this dream, right? Um, now let's continue and let's try to find out what is this image all about and how is it relevant to us? Because remember, what was this uh, prophecy um, for? Do you remember? Was it for Babylon's time or was it for some other time? What was the word being used there? Latter days, right? This, this prophecy is more, for, is more relevant for the end times. Right? And so if we claim that we are living in the end times, we need to study this prophecy. Right? So what is this all about? What is this head of gold, silver, uh, shoulder and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron and feet of iron and clay? What is this all about? Okay, so let's continue in verse 36. Yeah. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom power and strength and glory. And whosoever the children of man dwell, the beasts of the field and the fall of the heaven had he given unto thy hand, and had made thee rule over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Okay. So who is the head of gold? Who is the head of gold? Nebuchadnezzar. But actually, if you read verse 39, okay, let's just jump straight to verse 39 and just read. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Okay, so actually, this, uh, when Daniel said king, he, he didn't just mean King Nebuchadnezzar. Right? He was talking about a kingdom, his kingdom. And what was his kingdom? Babylon. So this head of gold represents Babylon. Okay? And so we've uh, read verse 39. So, um, I'll read again. After this shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall rule over all the earth. Now, what kingdom is this second kingdom? The kingdom of silver. How many of you know who defeated, which country or which nation defeated Babylon? Anyone know? Medo-Persia, right? You all remember uh, in Daniel chapter 5, right? Okay, let's go uh, to Daniel chapter 5 real quick. Let's just confirm this. Da uh, Daniel chapter 5, verse 28. Daniel 5, 28. Yes, 5, 28. Whereas the kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Okay, so um, you can re read this story by yourself, but this was um, Belshazzar, right? Belshazzar, Belshazzar, King Belshazzar, 
um, you remember he was holding a party and suddenly there was this handwriting on the wall, right? Which um, was actually God's judgment against his kingdom, right? Against Belshazzar. And Paris was one of the words written on the wall. And what does it say? His kingdom will be given to the Medes and the Persians. And true enough, what happened to Babylon? King Cyrus of Persia, do you, do, you, do you guys know how fortified Babylon was? How heavily fortified Babylon was? You know, Babylon's walls were thick enough that chariots can race side by side. You know chariots? They are huge, right? Imagine a wall so thick that chariots can race side by side. Babylon was a country that can run by itself, that don't need... Um, how to say, they don't need outside help. They have enough supplies to last for 20 years. Um, there was a river called the River Euphrates that runs through Babylon. And they could, they could just survive all on, just within their walls. They don't have to go out. And they were a country, they were a nation that was so strong that they thought that no one could defeat them. And so when you read in Daniel chapter 5, right, Belshazzar, when, when, the, when the armies of Cyrus, of Persia, they were sur surrounding Babylon, right? Babylon was surrounded, and yet they were still so confident that they partied, right? And they actually threw, you know, if you read history, they actually threw food on the Persian army just to taunt them, just to say we have enough supplies to last as long as you want. You can stay out there as long as you want. Under the desert heat, we won't care because why we have all that we need. They were that arrogant, right? And rightly so, because they were a fruitful nation. But what happened to them? Do you all remember? Do you all know what happened? They left the gates open, right? And somehow, Cyrus managed to drain the water out of the river Euphrates, managed to divert it somewhere else. And while they were partying, the Persian armies marched in and they defeated the Babylonian city. Right? So, this next kingdom is Middle Persia. Very clear, right? Very clear. Any questions so far? Any questions or inputs? Okay. All right, let's move on. We have uh, still have quite a bit. Um, all right, so what's after um, Middle Persia? Who defeated Middle Persia? Anyone who is really good in history? Who is it? Greece. Now, who was the famous general that, def that uh, fought right in the battle of, uh, what is that? Gaugamela, I think. Alexander the Great, right? He was the king that went against King Darius, right? He was heavily outnumbered. And yet, somehow, he was, he was able to defeat the Persian or the Middle Persian army, right? Um, if you, if we, um, actually in the following lessons, uh, I think in a few weeks' time, we would study more into this. Um, this prophecy is actually just a foundation, right, of what God is going to reveal in Daniel, in the further chapters of Daniel and also in Revelation. And we would actually further confirm that uh, these kingdoms are yeah, what we've stated it to be. Okay? Alright, so let's move on real quick. Uh, and another thing to note also, just a quick note, Greece was a nation that uses what? What was, what was their military famous for? Sorry? 
bronze, right? They, were, they used bronze armor, right? Uh, do you know the Greek, Greek armies, they used a big phalanx, right? They, the way they fought was to, was to use a long spear, and they were actually marched like this with their spears protruding out, and they were actually sliced through and pierced through enemies in front, right? That was their tactical um, strategy, right? So Greece was famous for bronze. Okay, let's continue to the next kingdom. Verse 40. And the fourth king shall be strong as iron, for as much uh, as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Hmm. Okay, so what are the characteristics of this fourth kingdom? When you read this verse, right, what is the adjective that you can use to describe this kingdom? Was this kingdom weak? It's a strong kingdom, right? Um, now, what was its strength? Was it a constructive strength? Or was it a destructive strength? Destructive, right? This kingdom breaks things, right? This kingdom breaks things into pieces and bruises things, right? Now, what, where is the strength of a country? Where can the... What is the strength of where is the strength of a country, of a nation? It's in its military, right? Um, now, just to tell you straight off, because we have not much time left, the kingdom that came right after Greece is Rome. Now, I understand if maybe if you, uh, if you know history that it's a bit different from the previous kingdoms in that Rome didn't conquer Greece, like how Greece conquered Middle Persia. Right? But uh, Rome, okay, this one you have to study more into history yourself. Um, it's actually a lot of history behind it. But um, I will not dwell into that actually. But what came after Greece was Rome. Okay, now what was Rome famous for? It's legions, right? It's military, right? I mean, those days when you see a Roman army, you have, they what? They strike fear, right? They strike fear in all the other people's hearts, right? Their army was fearful, right? They were strong. Um, now this now, let's, let's go to Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Now, these kingdoms that we are studying, right, these are worldwide um, powers that rule the then known world, right? And so, we are trying to prove how we know that iron is representing Rome, right? So, let's go to Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a de decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. So who was Caesar Augustus? He was the ruler of what? Rome, right? Roman emperor, right? Um, now, can you tax the whole world if you don't own the whole world? Can Malaysia tax Singapore? <laughs> no, right? So, Rome was a worldwide power. It ruled the whole continent of, almost the whole continent of Europe, and also Asia, parts of Asia, right? And so, um, now, do you guys remember who was the ruling power during Jesus' time? The Romans, right? Um, do you remember? Now, Rome was, okay, like what we said just now, they were very famous for it there, or, or one of their characteristics was their strength, right? Strength in their military, right? And apart from that, the Bible also describes them as what? A kingdom that bruises, right? Now, what do you bruise? Can you bruise... Uh, a thing? Or can you bruise 
your phone, what do you bruise? You bruise living things, right? You bruise people, right? You bruise flesh, right? And so, it's, um, I mean, very clear that, you see, even the Romans, right? What, were they, what was their uh, way of punishing people? They had many sorts of different, um, very uh, gross uh, sort of uh, executions, right? And one of which is crucifixion, right? And so, um, now very interestingly, if you look at Isaiah 53 verse 5, we can somewhat connect this to Daniel chapter 2 verse 40. Right, let's look at Isaiah 53 verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for, of our peace was upon him, and was his stripes we are healed. Mm. Who was bruised for iniquities? Jesus, right? And who was the ruling nation that bruised Jesus, literally? The Romans, right? So, very clear from history and from the Bible that the next ruling nation that rep is represented by iron was Rome. Okay? Any questions? Okay, let's go to the next one. Daniel 2.41, right? And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Mm. Now, what is this next kingdom? The kingdom of iron and clay. Right. Now, this kingdom is very different, right? Why? Because what is this? Now, what is, what is gold? It's a metal, right? What is this? A metal, right? Brass, metal, 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 non-metal. It's kind of interesting that this next kingdom, I mean, just from looking at that, we can have a very clear idea that this kingdom is very different from the, those kingdoms before it. Right. Um, now, what does clay represent in the Bible? Let's go to Isaiah 64, verse 8. What does clay represent? But now, O Lord, thou art our Father. They are, we are the clay, and thou art port, thou our porter, and we all are the work of thy hand. Mm. So what does the clay represent? Sorry? Us. Okay. But what do we call us? A people, which is a? I mean, what do we call a religious people? Like, we are a church, right? <laughs> Sorry. We are called a church, right? Um, so, now, but very interestingly, there's two kinds of clay being mentioned in verse 41, right? How does the clay start off as? What was the first, uh, how was the, what was the state of the clay in the beginning? It was a, no, from verse 41. No, that's another one. Potter's clay, right? Now this is a good clay, right? Just as uh, Isaiah 64 verse 8 says, right? Um, Thou art the potter, we are the clay, right? The church, this was a pure, good church, right? The potter's clay, right? So somehow, this kingdom started off with a pure and good church. Okay, what happened to the clay? It became miry clay. Now, uh, we will not go into miry clay, we will not study into miry clay so much, but miry clay is not a good clay. It, it is a, it is, if you look into the word miry, it's like mud, right? Uh, it's, it's sticky, it's boggy, right? 
it's not a good thing, right? Myri clay. So, what happens to this last kingdom is that the clay first started off as potter's clay, which is a good clay, and became what? A bad clay, which is miry clay. The clay has gotten what? Worse, right? And we've seen from Isaiah 40, 64 verse 8 that clay represents the church, right? His people, right? Which is his church, right? So this church started off as good and became somewhat bad. Now, what do we call that? Apostasy, right? Exactly, right? So this church was in apostasy. Now, one thing to note, now what, have we, what do we know about the iron? We know that it is represented by Rome, right? Now, what is Rome? It's, is it a political nation or is it a religious nation? Is it a religious power or a political power? It's a political power, right? All these nations before the iron and the clay, they were all political powers. But very interestingly, this last nation, it was not only a political power, but also a religious power, right? Political and religious combined. What happens is that when there, the church, when a political power combines with a religious power, persecution happens, right? We can see from the examples of Caiaphas, right? Caiaphas and Pilate. Now, what, did they, what happened when Caiaphas and Pilate sort of uh, collaborated? <laughs> Who died? Jesus. Persecution. Um, what happened when Saul, who is a religious leader, um, what happened when he got the letters from Rome to go to, uh, what was the place? But Damascus. What happened? What was he going to do? He was going to persecute the Christians. Um, and so it was with Balaam and Bala. So it was with Jezebel and Ahab. Right? Jezebel being the political power, Ahab being the religious leader. Whenever there is a combination of a political power and a religious power, there is always persecution. Only Christ... Now, only Christ can combine these two powers, right? Because if you look in, I'm just going to go through one verse. Uh, we're just going to breeze through this really quick. Um, in, um, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Let's just go there. Oh no, let's go to Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a saviour, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Hmm. So, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a what? Prince and a saviour. Prince, we can say is what? Political. Saviour. Religious. Only God can combine these two together and you'll still be harmonious. But whenever you see throughout the course of history, right, whenever human beings try to combine these two, there's always persecution. You can see that from the Dark Ages, right? When the, uh, when the Catholic Church was in the height of its power, what was rampant in its time? Persecution of Christians, right? And so we see this last kingdom is a kingdom of what? Not just political power, but also religious. But let's continue. Um, can someone read from Daniel chapter 2, verse 42? And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Mm. So what we know about this kingdom also, it's, it tried to unite, right? But what happens to this kingdom? It's what? Partly strong, partly broken. 
Now, which, which part of this kingdom do you think is strong? Which part do you think is strong? Just logically looking at this. Iron, right? Iron is definitely stronger than the clay. Right? The clay is the weak one. Now, when you, when you think, think about this, right? When you mix iron and clay together, what do you think? Which of the components has to compromise? The clay, right? The clay is the one that has to mold, right? That has to change shape, that has to compromise, right? In order to, to um, blend with the iron, right? The clay is the one that has to compromise. And so you see when there is a, comp when there is a unification of a state power and a religious power, the church is the one who always has to compromise. And so you see all throughout history, Whenever there's this unification of these two powers, the church is always the one that compromise in terms of its belief, in terms of its values, its standings, right? Um, and what happens in, as a result? When they compromise, persecution happens. Yeah. Okay, let's continue verse 43. Verse 43, as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Okay, so there's a word that stands out here, right? The word what? Cleave. Now, when, you, when we talk about the word cleave, what comes to your mind? Marriage, right? Um, Genesis 2, 24, right? Man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, right? And they shall be one flesh, right? So we see the iron and clay. What happens to the iron and clay? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of man, but they shall not cleave. So um, it's like iron and clay, they want to mingle, they want to be together, but they do not cleave. So this is Spiritual fornication, right? Um, what is spiritual fornication? The mingling of a political power and a religious power, which is what? A union which God cannot bless. That is fornication, right? Someone wanted to add something? No? Okay. Yeah, you know, another thing is this that. Uh Clay, which represents religion, does not have enforcement power. So in order to enforce their belief and decree, they have to utilize government power. You see? So this combination of iron and clay, where you know, of course we know uh, a particular religion, which we all know very well, uh, will, for example, you know, change the day of worship and to uh, enforce uh, Sunday law, they have to use legal power. So that is the you know, combination of uh, iron and clay. Yeah, exactly right. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, so this kingdom, they commit spiritual fornication, right? Mingling of church and state power. And that results in persecution. Okay, let's continue. We'll, we'll, we'll end really quick. Um, verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the, the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break the, in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Mm. So, okay, let's, let's continue with verse 45 as well. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. Mm. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Okay. So, um, God is going to set up his kingdom, right? We see all these worldly kingdoms, one from one to the other. But what, what is going to happen in the future is that God 
is going to set up his kingdom. And what does he say about his kingdom? It shall stand forever. Verse 44. Right? As great as Rome was, you know, Rome was a great nation, right? They ruled for, I um, can't remember how many years. Uh, almost a few hundred years, 500, 500, 600 years, right? Um, as great as Rome was, as great as Babylon was, Medo Persia was, Greece was, what are they now? History, right? But God is going to set up a kingdom that will stand forever, right? I hope that gives us some, some sort of excitement, right? That God is going to bring something that lasts forever, a kingdom that lasts forever, right? And so what does this mountain represent? Or what does this stone represent? Anyone? Second coming or God's kingdom, right? Um, yeah. We, we, actually, if you <laughs> study into Daniel 7, there's more, uh, the, now God uses this method of re, what we call repeat and enlarge, right? So this is actually just a foundation of what God is going to reveal in the further chapters of Daniel, right? Actually, if you look into Daniel and Revelation, the rest of Daniel, the crust of um, its focus is on mainly the feet, right? On, mainly on the latter days, right? Um, and you will find that actually in Daniel 7, uh, there's more that Daniel is going to reveal, or God is going to reveal through Daniel, right? But what, for now, we, we're just going to say the rock represents God's kingdom, Okay? Right, so um, all right, so what does clay, iron and clay, what is this kingdom? What can we, what can we call this kingdom? What is this? What is iron? Rome. What is the clay? Church, right? So this kingdom is Rome plus church. And we will find out more about this kingdom as we study. Right, next week we're going to study uh, about Daniel 7, which is Antichrist. Um, we're going to dwell on that for two weeks. And we would further understand, or God's going to further review, what is this kingdom all about and what it's going to do in the future. Or what it has done in the past as well. And we are going to identify what is this kingdom. Because right now, we just know that all we know is this kingdom is Rome plus church. We don't know anything else. Right? So, um, I hope this will somewhat whet your appetite because this Daniel chapter 2 is just a foundation, right? It's very important because all the prophecies, the 2300 days, the uh, uh, 70 weeks, all those prophecies are founded on this single dream, right? So, um, and we, we're also going to study about Mark of the Beast, um, all those things, Sunday Law, all those are somewhat related to this or built upon this dream. Yeah, so, any questions? You know, what can we learn from this before we end? Now, your, your, each of you have the handouts, right? What does it say in the last part? We can trust that the Bible, we can trust the Bible because what it says has come true, right? You see, when the Bible, uh, when God reviews this prophecy, right, it's like, wow, so so simple and so clear-cut, right? Like, oh, first kingdom, Babylon. Second kingdom, Mesopotamia. But do you know that in between all this, there's a lot of history that goes behind these, just these two kingdoms, right? But God, in His wisdom, right, He laid it out so accurately, the um, sequence of these kingdoms. 
Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, Rome, Roman Church. Right. So one thing we can learn from this is that what? God, we can trust that God or, or the Bible is true. The Bible is accurate. Right. Just from history itself, we can check. All these have come to pass and uh, it was predicted way before it happened. Way before. Right. Number two, what, what can we learn? Jesus is coming soon. Now, where do you think we are in this image? Which period of time do you think we are? Are we in the head? <laughs> we are right at the feet, right? Rome is already passed. Rome and church. This is where we are at. And what is the kingdom that's going to come next? God's kingdom. You see, we are, very, we are right at the edge of time, right? God is going to come so soon. And that is the reason why we study prophecy, right? Because prophecy is supposed to help us see, reveal the thoughts of our hearts, right? In light of this, or in the time that we're living in, how are we living, right? How would you live your life if you know that you're going to die tomorrow? How would you live your life if you know that Jesus is coming very soon, in, probably in your lifetime. Right? And so, studying this should help us understand how close we are to Jesus coming. Right? And also, the third point says what? God can govern the rise and fall of kingdoms. Right? Won't you put your life in His hands that He may lead your life? Right? Um... Any, any questions? Any inputs before we end? I hope it's clear. Because this is going to be... Um, I think next week, <laughs> um, Elder David will be coming and teaching. And uh, I hope you remember each one of these kingdoms. right? Because we are going to go through um, each one of these and we're going to revise every single week those kingdoms. right? So I hope everyone remembers. Um, yeah. Because as we study more, we're going to add to. We're going to add to this a bit more, right? Because there's a lot more that God wants to reveal. Okay. Anyone has uh, anything? No. Okay. Let's pray. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you that you are a God who we can trust. You are a God who um, we can count on because you have said, you have prophesied and all these things have come true. Lord, I pray that you help us understand that the times that we are living in and help us to see and understand the thoughts of our heart that we would see the need of you, Lord. Father, I pray that you would be with each one of us here as we've studied Daniel chapter 2. May these lessons ring loud in our hearts and may it only compel us and encourage us to study even more that we would be ready when you come again. Thank you for being with us um, throughout our study. Uh, thank you for your prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.